So in, a, in an attempt to try and make sure everyone makes their flight yesterday, we made sure nobody missed the boat. Today we make sure nobody misses their flight. We're going to make a start. Um, our first uh, speaker, the final tutorial of this week, uh, is on the theme of how quantum is ado. And our speaker is Maciek Levenstein. And without further ado, go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, does this work? Good. Uh, so, a person who doesn't show a proper sense of responsibility is called irresponsible. I hope to hear you have an example in two senses. First of all, I don't read, of course, my emails, so I just glance them. So, I didn't realize that I was supposed to prepare a tutorial and I made an overview talk about activities in NATO uh, battles in, uh, in ICFO, in my institute. Uh, second of all, uh, two days ago, I tried to make it a little more in the direction of the tutorial and I changed my slides and I sent it by WeTransfer to wrong address. <laughs> so, I will improvise with what I have. Okay, so indeed the title is then Quantum Battles at Eek for Quantum Optics Theory. It's not only Quantum Optics Theory because Javier is a part of this operation and his quantum information theory. Uh, the, I always start my uh, talks with the logos of all the organizations that put the money. This is Spain, so you cannot get one big grant for everything. You have to collect from all the possible things. And uh, um, But still, there are many logos, so the group is huge. It's 32 people at this moment as a theory group. Uh, um, 17 uh, PhD students is horrible, it's too much. And we uh, collaborate with very many people in all over the world, uh, including uh, uh, UK and, six, eight, and uh, other countries. The, this is, I think, the photo of the retreat that we did in Delta del Ebro. In, uh, it was, I think, in the end of, it was still into 21, no? 22, no, 22, 22. Maybe. Anyway, I lost some weight since then, so this is remarkable. <laughs> but, uh, okay, so the outline is that I will go through the, uh, all the subject of the quantum battles in NATO science and make some comments about what we do, but of course I will focus, so I will go chirality, symmetry, tailored fields, NATO science of solids, and how quantum is ato, but I will focus on this, how quantum is ato. And also in this first part, I will try to make comments uh, how quantum is ato to the things that are there. Okay, so we start with this uh, chirality, symmetry, and Taylor field. So I'll give you some examples of research that we do, or we have been doing a big for. Uh, and uh, most of the things are related to the people who are here. So uh, Andy Bax, uh, uh, who uh, did the PhD with Carla, at some moment came as a postdoc to ICFO. And then, of course, he is a world master in uh, electron uh, vorticity. So we started to work on those things. So this is the first paper, which is together with uh, not only Carla, but also with Andy Brown from Belfast, who probably is here. I don't <laughs> agree. I'm sorry. <laughs> but I don't remember faces. I mean, irres irresponsibility is infinite, like, um, you know. Anyway, so this is a paper in which we study the ionization. And, uh, and we look at the, uh, using very different theoretical methods, how does the uh, orbital angular momentum of electron uh, appears in the ionization process. So you have a comparison of, uh, of very uh, different approaches. So Andy is a master of uh, strong field approximation in particular, but also Q prop, which is the time dependent Schrodinger equation. And their matrix, I think he was responsible. Okay. I already did another thing which was not responsible. So the, uh, this whole approach to this uh, uh, electronic, uh, uh, to vorticity of electrons or angular momentum of electrons has been 
continued in this paper, which was done by uh, master student Javier Bar uh, Barcons, and Andres Ordonez, who was uh, from the group of uh, Olga Smirnova, so another crazy guy on chirality, and Andy again. And this he, here, what, uh, what we proposed is to look, to detect the chirality of uh, molecules uh, by looking exactly at the same orbital angular momentum of electrons. So the scheme is very simple. You have a chiral molecule, which can be oriented arbitrarily in the space, so you don't have to align it or something like that. And you shine a linearly polarized light, uh, which is not here, apparently. But uh, anyway, uh, you shine the linearly polarized light on it, and then you look at the vorticity of the electrons that go out. So it's we called or they called it uh, photoelectron uh, vortex decrease, I think. Okay, and this is a very nice uh, method, and of course this has uh, possible applications for everything. Okay, uh, one, uh, we have also tradition in ICFO of working on tailored fields. Already uh, in, this, in this paper it's not tailored, it's just linearly polarized. Like in the spirit of the talks that we heard in uh, here about the switching the valleys in graphene, where the trefoil uh, field was uh, necessary. Here, this is uh, even more complicated. This is a, a pay, uh, this is a work by Emilio Pisanti, um, already many years ago, in which he proposed this the, uh, to make a, uh, essentially a knots in the polarization space. So if you look at how the vector of the, of the electric field goes, I mean, it makes these very complicated uh, structures, which are more complicated even than the Möbius strip, because it makes really non-trivial three-dimensional knots. And this kind of fields we first uh, realized at the level of weak intensity in ICFO with our experimental colleagues, Juan Perez Torres, but then, of course, you can think about applying this kind of fields to the, uh, to the uh, again, the first line of authors has been cut because it's an old version of my talk, which I corrected two days ago by, send, by, by uh, however, sent to wrong people. Anyway, <clears throat> so the first author here was, or second author was Laura Rego, who is here. And uh, the, the, the idea here is, this was collaboration with Margaret Murnane, the idea is to take this not uh, in polarization space field and apply it in a strong intensity limit to, uh, to some, uh, to atoms simply. And this leads to interesting, of course, you look at the harmonic generation in particular, and you, uh, you can control, by applying this very tailored field, you can control properties, in particular also angular momentum of the outgoing harmonics. Okay, so this is, I think, everything that I wanted to say about uh, this first part of the, uh, of the uh, areas that are auto signs of solids. So again, we have a long plastic uh, uh, tradition of working on that. Uh, I think this paper was even, I think, Shambu or somebody's here. So this is a paper which is very old. It is from the time where uh, Alexis Chacon was in my group as a postdoc. He then left for Los Alamos and then to Korea. So there are many authors from different places on the paper. Uh, and the idea here is to try to use the harmonics to detect the topological properties of the material. And the mm, model that was studied in this paper was the famous Haldane model, which was mentioned by Dieter, I guess, in his talk. Uh, so this is a hexagonal lattice in which you have a simple hopping between the uh, next neighbor. You might have this uh, difference between the 
local potential on, on the blue and red uh, sides. Uh, but you also have second order hopping, which is uh, has some phase. So there is no magnetic field here, but still uh, in this model shows anomalous quantum hole effect and uh, uh, and uh, in particular shows the uh, shows the uh, topological phases. So depending on the parameters, which are the phase of this of this second neighbor tunneling, and uh, and the difference between the potential on blue and red ones. I mean, you have this phase diagram in which uh, there are two regions where the Chern number, the topological invariant, are. Uh, non-trivial minus one or one and what we do we shine the laser here and we look at the harmonic generation using approach which is like discussed here semi-classic like discussed in the talk by Brabets or in the talk of Shambo uh, using semi-classical block equations with the t2 the phasing time and uh, this kind of stuff but with very with uh, in uh, with uh, of course the contribution from the very connection and in particular then very curvature because this is a topological. And the main result of this uh, studies is that if you look in the trivial phase on the harmonics, there is, uh, and you apply, you, you, you excite the system or you probe the system with right circular depolarized light or left circular depolarized light, then in the trivial phase, essentially there is no difference or the difference is kind of chaotic or not, nothing significant. In contrast, if you go to topological phase, the blue curve and the red curve are different by several orders of magnitude. And, and therefore, if you look in fact here on the harmonics, which have the number Q modulo three equal one, so 10, uh, 13 and so on. I don't know. I cannot calculate one to one so fast. But anyway, uh, yeah, 13, uh, 16, and so on. Then there is a huge difference between the re response to the right and left polarized fields. And you can even plot it as a function of these parameters of the systems of this phase of the second uh, neighbor tunneling. And you see that. You can really detect the chain number. So in the topological phase, you get minus one here, plus one here, and in the trivial phase, something completely, uh, let's say, random. Another thing that we are also uh, very much interested in the context of solids is the thing uh, of not uh, just detecting the properties of the solid, but generating properties. And uh, there was a paper uh, in uh, a couple of years ago by Andrea Cavalleri in which they took the linearly, uh, sorry, the circularly polarized laser field, applied it to the graphene-like material and generated the so-called churn uh, insulator. And here is a similar paper which was published in Physical Review B a couple of years ago uh, in which we applied the linearly polarized field to graphene-like material, but with the orbital angular momentum. So in this way, we, of course, everything is not, uh, how do you say, not uniform in space, but uh, you still can generate the, uh, the Chen uh, insulator here, so non-trivial topological state. And this is, uh, in a sense, gives different type of controls for this type of experiment. This is more corresponding to actually, depends on the material, obviously. It can be terahertz laser or it can be our laser, so to say, in that effect. Another paper that I want to mention in this context was also discussed yesterday in the discussion is the paper by Edita Oshika, who was a summer student actually at IFO. Uh, Alexis Sacon was one of the leaders. This was collaboration with Sasha Lanzmann also. Uh, and uh, this is one of the first papers in which, in my opinion, at least in the context of strong fields, the Vanier Bloch uh, formulation was systematically put forward. 
So the Vanier block uh, formulation, I mean, the block block has been discussed by Brabets in his talk here, uh, and several people were discussing, but the Vanier block is nice because you go to the uh, valence band and you use this localized Vanier function. So this is much more similar to atomic physics because you start with the electron, which is localized somewhere. It is then uh, uh, tunnels out, if you wish, in quotation mark to the conduction band, propagates in the conduction band and recombines. The difference is, of course, that it can recombine in the same place, which is the most probable process, but it can also recombine in a different place because the Vanier function is first of all, it's not an eigenfunction of the Hamiltonian. So it, 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 it spreads, in fact, in time. So you have some populations here from the beginning and in the course of time even more. And therefore you can recombine in a different place. And that's a very interesting process. It's like in the molecules, which Wilhelm knows very well because he wrote many papers uh, on the subject. But this is uh, something that may lead to novel phenomena. Okay, so now we go to the main subject, so to say. So if I would be asked how much of these things are, uh, how quantum is ato in this context, it is, uh, in many aspects, but the most important will be discussed here in this context. So I will focus on the problem of uh, quantum electrodynamics of super intense laser matter physics. Uh, and the title, uh, of course, is wrong here on the top. It should be QED or something. And I corrected it in the, this beautiful new version of the talk that hasn't been downloaded, unfortunately because it was sent to wrong people. Okay, so there will be general introduction about uh, time dependence Schrodinger equation and some unitaries. There will be uh, something about conditioning. So how do we uh, treat this thing to see some quantum effects and some um, discussion about generalization. So everything is based on this uh, paper uh, which we have published uh, in 2021, if I remember well, uh, uh, in generation of, I stress, optical Schrodinger cats uh, states. Uh, now, normally, and we have uh, heard it in the talk of Mark uh, at this conference, Schrodinger cat, well, what is a Schrodinger cat? It's a superposition of two distinct macroscopic states. So cat is that or cat is alive. But normally, as in the description of Schrodinger, you also associate with this, this trigger state. So the uh, atom which is decayed or, uh, or atom which is not decayed. And of course, if you uh, trace out the trigger, then you get immediately uh, not, uh, just a mixture of cat being dead and uh, cat being uh, alive. And this is therefore very unstable with respect to any kind of observation. Okay, what we are talking about here will be superposition of two distinct, in a sense macroscopically, but even not so macroscopically, but anyway, two distinct coherent state of the, of the, of the electromagnetic field. And this is much more stable with respect to this kind of thing. There will be also trigger, and I will explain you what is the trigger here. It will be harmonics, roughly speaking. We will have a coherent state of uh, fundamental multiplied by the coherent states of uh, harmonic that are produced, plus other coherent state of uh, fundamental multiplied by vacuum of the harmonics, because we will be looking at conditioning and harmonics. So this is the, the spirit here, and these states are much more stable in a sense that I'm talking about. Okay, so let's uh, go. The whole thing we want to solve is a shredding, time dependent Schrodinger equation. I'm using single atom, uh, single active electron approximation. Uh, of course, we can try to do it for more complicated uh, situations, but the uh, the Hamiltonian now 
it's likely we are used in auto science. There is a, a laser free Hamiltonian, which is the kinetic energy plus the Coulomb like um, binding potential for the uh, single active electron. There is a, a interaction with the laser, which the main difference is that this is a dipole interaction. So it's a dipole of the electron E times R times electric field, but the electric field is now operator. It's a quantum electrodynamics, okay? So I want to have a quantum field here. And then there I have a Hamiltonian of the free electromagnetic field, okay? So normally we don't do that. Normally we say this is strong field, fluctuations, quantum fluctuations, forget it. Just take it as a C number, a classical field. But here we want to study the, the effects of quantum electrodynamics. Okay, so uh, in order to describe the pulse of electromagnetic field, I need the continuous spectrum of my uh, photons, okay? Because otherwise I cannot do that, all right? But of course, in this first paper, we have done a simplified theory in which we, uh, we really concentrated on discrete spectrum of the field corresponding to fundamental and harmonic. How do we describe the pulse then? Well, the trick was to introduce this kind of time dependent coupling constant in front of the interaction Hamiltonian that describes how we couple and decouple with the, with the field. Okay. But it's a little simpler. We have done the same thing in a quantum electro, in the fully quantum electrodynamical description later, but it's more technical, it's more technical, it's more difficult. This is just simple. Okay, so this function is between zero and one, and roughly describes the, the the amplitude of the pulse. The coupling constant. We, oops, not my fault. Now it's you. Now it's you. Now it's I'm responsible. Okay, so uh, I mean this coupling constant is from quantum electrodynamics. So. Okay, now, now you do some tricks, okay? And the tricks are the following. In this problem that we are solving, the initial state is electron is in the ground state. The fundamental is in the coherent state, alpha L, fundamental laser, and the harmonics are in the vacuum state, okay? This is my initial state. Well, the first thing that I want to do, I want to shift this initial state to the vacuum. So I use the Glauber's mm, displacement operator, which creates coherent state, and I apply it on this new wave function. This wave function will have an initial state, which is ground state of electron, vacuum of the laser, and vacuum of harmonic, because it's shifted later, okay? This is just a trick. But this trick is nice because it allows me to separate the semi-classical or quasi-classical part of the dynamics. <clears throat> so now for this new wave function, which is uh, this one, <clears throat> you have an equation which looks like that. There is an interaction with the quantum electromagnetic field with the dipole moment, but there is also a Hamiltonian, which is really a semi-classical Hamiltonian. So this is a Hamiltonian in which uh, I have a laser free part, but then I have intera dipole interaction with the classical field, with the average value of my coherent state that I had at the beginning, okay? Which is also put into the interaction picture, so it's time dependent, okay? And this is how it looks like, okay? So I just have oscillations here, oscillations there, and that's it. And my f of t plays the role of to describing the pulse effect. The next trick that we can do is to go to interaction picture with respect to this semi-classical Hamiltonian. We know how to solve it, for instance, using strong field approximation or time-dependent Schrodinger equation or whatever. I mean, all the people here know how to do that. So it's formally, it's of course complicated, but we can go to this interaction picture. If we go to the interaction picture, we obtain the Schrodinger equation for the wave function which has this form. It has quantum 
field. And now this, op uh, this position operator, if you wish, dipole moment of the electron now, it's a time dependent operator, which uh, we know how to calculate in, in, in all our methods, but it's semi-classical one. So this is the dipole moment that I obtain, assuming that the field has uh, given form in terms of C number. The next trick will be in the spirit of strong field approximation. In the strong field approximation, you know what happens. The only states which are important are ground state and the states in the continuum. So I'm going to use identity operator several times to apply to this uh, equation, uh, but only focusing on ground state and uh, states in the continuum. In particular, I'm going to project this equation on the ground state. So I will have a projection of this wave function. This wave function is only in the space of, uh, of photons. So project after projection on the ground state is just a photon state. So I project on ground state, project on ground state. I have to put identity here. And this identity is this thing. But I'm talking about harmonic generation here mostly. So in harmonic generation, the effect of depletion of the ground state is small. So I forget about this part. And then in effect, I have this uh, very uh, simple equation for the new wave function, that it's a quantum field, a quantum electromagnetic electric field, average value of the dipole moment, because I have ground state, ground state here, which is calculated from semi-classical theory uh, and the field again. And this equation is trivial to solve because uh, everybody will see what happens. I mean, the solution is of course, time ordered product, but this guy is linear in creation and inhalation operators. And therefore, if I take exponents of it, what I can do is only shift the coherent states. I cannot do anything else. In this simple approximation that I neglect depletion, Coherent state remains coherent, but it gets shifted. And that's the main story here. So the uh, final state of the uh, photons is I come back to shift, I shift back to the original uh, coherent amplitude of the laser, but it is undergoing shift because it interacts with the, uh, with the matter. And there are harmonics, which are also in the coherent state, because from this equation, I don't get anything else but coherent state. Okay. Now, of course, this, this coefficients at this shift are very small for single atom, but you have many atoms, so you have to be uh, careful. And in principle, you should multiply this shift by the number of atoms that contribute to the face matched signal of harmonic. This is a, I mean, this is phenomenological, but it works quite well. Okay. So then you have bigger shifts here. And this is what Paris Salas has done in his experiment. He has uh, took a coherent state, put it to the atomic target, which was gas. Uh, this undergoes shift because of the effects that I was just saying. So it's a shifted coherent state. And then he wants to measure this coherent state. But this coherent state has 10 to seven photons on average, a little too much. So what he does, he makes a ampli coherent amplitude attenuation by homodyning with, uh, with another mode of the same frequency and reducing this, this guy to let's say 10 photons. With 10 photons, he can make tomographic measurement of the state, okay? But before doing that, he also conditions this state, so it's a post-selection measurement, conditions on the harmonic generation, okay? In effect, the final state here is a shifted coherent state minus projection of the original uh, coherent state, which doesn't uh, contain any harmonics. Okay. And this is a uh, Schrodinger kitten, let's say, maybe not cat, but Schrodinger kitten. It's a superposition of two 
different, maybe not so much different, but different coherent states. Mm -mm. In this case, meroscopic, because I, he reduced it to 10 photons. Originally, it's in principle, if you would not do this attenuation, it would be macroscopic because they are huge, these guys. But in order to measure, he did this. And then he measures the Wigner function using tomography. So we're using common dining techniques again and things like that. If he doesn't do any co conditioning, the output is a coherent state. So the Wigner function is a Gaussian. Okay. But if he does, he gets something like that. So this is the Schrodinger kitten. Uh, after taking into account all the resolution, -la 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 and so on, he clearly sees the negative parts of the Wigner function and things like that. This is the team that was on this uh, paper. Philip is here and Javier is here. Andy is here. <clears throat> Andres was yesterday, but <clears throat> Today, I don't see him, uh, Emilio and uh, Marcello. And this is the uh, Creed team of experimentalists, Paris Tallers, and Theo Harris uh, Lampro. So, what can you do with this more? You can generalize. So, the first thing you can do, and this is what Javier mainly was doing, you can uh, try to condition on other processes, not harmonic generation, but for instance, above threshold ionization, so electrons. They have data apparently for that, but uh, there is no mm, paper yet analyzed with this data. So the difference here is that, of course, while in the harmonic generation, I was arguing you can forget about this guy because the depletion is small. Here you cannot because you look at the electrons, so you have to take it into account. So the theory is much more complicated. But still, is doable, and Javier was able to do it. The most important thing is that you have, again, shifts of these coherent states that appear here, but the shifts now depend on the momentum of the outgoing electron. So if you condition on electrons, you will have immediately entanglement between the outgoing electron kinetic uh, uh, momentum and electromagnetic field because the shifts depend on that. So for different guys, they are different. As I'm saying, I mean, this is much more technical theory and then what can I say, we calculated it. Again, you get this Schrodinger cat type, Wigner function and things like that, but uh, yeah. Another thing which is very important is a paper by uh, Philip as a leader is that what do we really have here? I mean, because I was focusing on the state of the fundamental, but the truth is that what one creates in this uh, approach are the entangled states of the fundamental and harmonics. So the true state that I get here, and they go back, and they go. Yeah. The true state that I get here is a shifted coherent state of the fundamental tensor product with the coherent states of the harmonics. The true state on which I condition is not shifted st coherent state of the fundamental tensor product with vacuum of the harmonics. So obviously it's a mode entangled state for the for the electromagnetic system. And then when you trace out harmonics, you still get this shredding your cats and so on, but this is what you have to do. And this is what has been uh, essentially analyzed in uh, this paper of uh, Philip and others, of course, I mean. And again, you get, now you can talk about the Wigner functions for the harmonics, and they are also showing this uh, Schrodinger kitten properties. Okay, another thing you can do is uh, solid state. So we are coming back to the second part of the auto battle. Uh, and this is a paper by Javier, uh, which is uh, it's still not published, right? But it's on the archives. So 
again in the in the semiconductors you have uh, the main thing again is this thing that I told you about the vanier um, vanier block picture. You start in the localized vanier function, you go to the conduction band, but you can uh, uh, recombine in a different place. And depending on where you recombine, the shift of the coherent state will be different. So automatically, you create, without any conditioning, you create entanglement between the position of the electrons and the electromagnetic field. Okay, and this is what is analyzed essentially in this paper. These effects are not very big, but visible. Okay, um, all right. So you can increase this effect, in fact, by applying the same conditioning method that I was discussing to the solid state. And this is what Paris is now analyzing, I understand, in his Paris Salas in the laboratory in Heraklion. The question that one has to answer is how to really detect this uh, kind of Schrodinger kittens. Normally, as I told you at the beginning, you measure and uh, you destroy the cat. Here it's not so bad because these are optical uh, Schrodinger cats. So you can measure average value of annihilation operator is non zero because these are superposition of coherent states. So there is some number. You can measure square of annihilation, 17th power and things like that. There is way, okay? What we, uh, there is a paper now in the archives in which we use the second harmonic. So we, we put our signal to the nonlinear crystal and generate second harmonics in this crystal in a fancy way. And this is how we measure the properties of the Schrodinger cut. Here, I have a slides which are, uh, maybe more uh, traditional for the quantum optics people. So what we want to do is homodyning, but not the standard homodyning. Because in the standard homodyning, what you have is that the local oscillator is either much more stronger than a signal, so you measure the quantum fluctuation of the signal, or it's much weaker than the signal and, and things like that. Here we want to have these guys of the same order, same frequency and same order. Okay, and then uh, what we want to do is we want to, to do photon counting after passing the beam splitter. And beam splitter has two parameters, roughly speaking, whether it's uh, 50, 50, 40, 60, et cetera. So the angle theta that tells you how much you split in, in up and down, and the phase, which it has also a phase. And then you do this uh, photon counting, and then indeed from this photon distribution, I mean, the, the method is uh, nice because you can probably apply it for the states which have 100 photons now. So you will have uh, characterization of Schrodinger cut that have 100 photons, not only that. It's, it's less demanding, but it's of course very difficult to experiment. And uh, as I said, we have worked uh, on the uh, quantum, fully quantum electrodynamical description of this uh, area. Uh, so quantum electrodynamics in the sense of continuous spectrum, et cetera, et cetera. The ambition of this paper, which is a tutorial in PhysRevX quantum, was to really kind of follow the Kantanoji books in the sense of really Hamiltonian, when the thing is applied, dipole, all the approximations and things like that. So this is a good starting point to learn how to work with this system. Okay, and now, now what? Oh, it doesn't work. Okay, so now I have a list of uh, papers, but this is where I was working in the last two days because I was putting here the names of the people who are here. Okay, so uh, in order to give you a more general uh, look at who is doing this kind of thing. So, uh, so this uh, generation and application of massively quantum correlated states we have written in the last two years, actually there are 13 papers now already in the, in the archives and things like that. And there are several in the pipeline. 
But who are the people who are working on this? So first of all, I would like to mention the group of uh, Technion. So Oren is here and probably he will talk about it. And Dido Camina. These are the people who in particular have an idea of applying quantum uh, fields, so squeezed fields, to create even more quantum fields. Okay, so this is a and this is a different approach and now we are post-selection conditioning people and they are really try put the quantum already at the beginning and see what's going on okay there is a, a interest in this approach in the group of uh, stephanie greffer there is a recent paper i think from may or something like that in the archive where they study the harmonics in solids uh, and in particular, this so that I don't know who mentioned that the Bruno harmonics in the intraband. Okay, there are uh, so this is another reference here. Another reference uh, is uh, Misha Ivanov, obviously, and Olga Smirnova. They also are interested in and they collaborate also with us. We have some joint projects in the pipeline. Uh, mm, but there is not so much in, uh, I would say. It's really a kind of uh, starting area, I would say. Okay. Other thing that I was mentioning in the first part here was using auto science methods for detection of the uh, topology of strongly correlated systems and chirality and things like that. So I started with this paper on circular decoys by Alexis. Uh, this is a paper which I should have mentioned, but I didn't. Uh, this is the Jens Bigert experiment in which he measures harmonics from the uh, HITC superconductor. And he really, uh, by looking at the harmonics, you, he is able by, uh, by looking at the temperature dependence of this harmonic, he is able to distinguish between different phases. There is a, strange metal phase, pseudo-gap phase, and superconducting phase. And the behavior of harmonics is different in different phases. We did the theory for that, uh, which is based essentially on the trivial kind of uh, fermionic Gaussian states, or if you wish, pairing theory. But it works quite well, so this is a nice thing. And we have several papers which are related to what Dieter Bauer was uh, was uh, talking. So this is like detecting, using harmonics to detect topological eff effects, uh, like uh, Majorana zero volts in the quantum wires in this uh, uh, typical system that people are hoping to see Majoranas. Uh, also in the Sue Schrieffer Heger chains. In fact, we have a paper on Sue Schrieffer. Hager uh, chain with interaction, so very much similar to what uh, Dieter was saying. So here, if I would say, uh, where is the, where are the groups that you should look for on this kind of uh, subject, is in particular Dieter. This is he is one of the world leaders since many years. In fact, he was inspiration for our papers very much. Uh, another thing, which I also mentioned here, is to use out of physics methods to generate the interesting states, topological or strongly correlated. So I, I told you about, uh, I don't know which one. Uh, well, actually here there is not, but anyway. I told you about this paper that uh, uh, I, I yes, fermionic chain insulator, this one, I told you about this one. So you shine the laser and you create a, a chain insulator in the system. But we have much more of this. In particular, uh, this goes back to the collaboration with Simon Wall, who used to be uh, in uh, ICFO, but now it's in Aarhus. Uh, and uh, so this goes to the ideas of really generating or controlling quantum phases in dynamics by using lasers. In his case, it was mostly terahertz uh, lasers. But now we work with uh, Alan Johnson, who is in 
in there, so in Madrid, and uh, and we work on theory of this kind of thing. So you have an ultrasound pulse, usually it will be terahertz or something like that, and you try to control, really to create the thing. So it is, of course, in the spirit of uh, generate superconductivity by a laser, but it's not necessarily superconductivity. It can be other interesting states and things like that. Uh, I put here the the things about uh, uh, tailored fields because this is related to creating chirality or creating uh, uh, topological states of electrons in this case. And uh, as I'm saying, I enjoyed very much in the last year's collaboration so with uh, Laura, who is here. Okay, another subject, which is how quantum is atom, is a subject that we heard in this conference very many times. It's a subject which I call Serfal processing. So it's from German and probably it goes back to shredding the edge, uh, but I don't know. Mm. So what does it mean? I have a system which really decays into two parts or three parts or something like that. So we have heard a lot of talks here about it, starting with the, the absolute pioneer of this kind of uh, physics is Mark, which started to do it, I don't know, 10 years ago or something like that. Sorry? Excellent. Maybe accidentally, but it was very pioneering and very, uh, how do you call it, uh, uh, visionary, I would say. This was uh, really like that. So there are more people who, are, who have been talking about it here. We have a talk by Marco uh, about bail inequalities. We had the talk by Francois about uh, uh, the same uh, situations in chemistry. I think there was one more, but I don't remember now. Okay, so what's happening here is uh, you really, uh, you try to look at the entanglement of the products. Ah, sorry, of course, the French guys, the Charles and, uh, and the Swedish French, Hugo. I don't know, Hugo is Swedish or French? Swedish, then Hugo. <laughs> not, not Hugo, but... Hugo, <laughs> Hugo. Okay, so uh, there were two talks, right? It's everything about the similar situation. You uh, look at the uh, decay and then you look at the reduced density matrix of the products. And you try to say something about the entanglement of the products. In the case of uh, lectures yesterday, it was entanglement of the electron with the uh, parent ion. Uh, in, uh, or entanglement between the two electrons and so on. And we have done this paper with uh, Andrew and Lars, in which we look at the uh, Rezai, yeah, Rezai uh, process, so resonant excitation subsequent ionization. So we have two electrons now, and we can ask what is the, whether there is entanglement in these two products. And what we do is we look at the angular momentum and the favorite quantity of Andrew. So angular momentum of these electrons. So it's a essentially q space because they can have angular momentum plus one because of conservation or something like that. Plus one, zero, or projection of angular momentum plus one, zero, and minus one. And we look at the, and we apply a simple uh, partial transpose criterion to, to check the entanglement, and it's quite strong. And I think this kind of research will be, it's very intensive because there are experiments in Saclay and in Lund, and this is uh, something that is going to be continued and, and, and in uh, Max Bohr. Okay, so this is something that is very important, and this is where ATO is quantum or evident. What's going on? Okay, everything can be, of course, increased by uh, applying machine learning to these things, and this is. Obvious, everybody is doing there. That was mentioned yesterday in the context of 
of I don't remember the experiments of uh, Charles, no, or, or or the or Hugo. This is one of our papers. So it's not so important. It's about we take the data from the double ionization experimental data, also from Phil from the Stanford group of Phil Baxbaum, and we put it to this machine learning. Uh, uh, scheme and then we reproduce the properties of the laser pulse which are not with the accuracy which is actually let's say better than experimental accuracy and the conclusion is to enjoy physics and beyond and uh, uh, i enjoy through conduct to the music so i give you the i wrote this book recently about uh, amato's guide to avant-garde it's a guide to uh, cd recordings uh, you can find it on the uh, on the web, uh, um, but we also work really of trying to sonify quantum processes. This is a paper that we wrote some time ago. Reiko Yamada, who is the girl on the left, she's a composer. She's a PhD. Is uh, sorry, she is a doctor of com of musical composition, and she is a postdoc since uh, already two and a half years. And we try to translate. In this case, we were looking at the. How to, I mean, you know that in the contemporary music, randomness was used since the time of Xenakis or John Cage. So we do something like that, but with the count of random number uh, generators. And I don't know if you will hear it because. Can, can we? So it's a contemporary music. Roughly speaking, the, this is a composition for the Andres Levin Richter is 83 years old. So originally he was doing it for tapes. He was actually a collaborator of Edgar Varese. The French people should know who was Edgar Varese, do they? The, uh, so, the, so the music is uh, this kind of contemporary uh, music without too much harmony and things like that, but uh, it involves this randomness in a sense that he, in the composi compositorial process, was using quantum random generators to, to make certain things. We hear it or we don't hear it? <laughs> okay, I shut up then. I'm finishing. But I want, I have one. Have one, have one, have one. No, okay, stop it. I have another one, but I, we will not say that. Why do I say about this music thing? Because in fact, can I see the screen? Or no? So a recent project about the music was actually sonification of the Wigner function that I, which Philip was involved, of the Wigner function of the Schrodinger kittens that we had. So it's a time dependent of this Wigner function in a non-canonical way. They translated to, to sounds, in particular uh, to sounds for the string quartet. So she has composed a string quartet where the negative parts of Wigner function are in a sense, uh, identified with staccato kind of uh, uh, elements of the, of the music. Unfortunately, we cannot see anything, but I think I should finish, right? Okay. Hey, any questions, comments? Perhaps in the spirit of uh, it being a tutorial, you can help me out by explaining what, what is the Wigner function, what it shows us about the systems you're looking at. Okay, the Wigner function is an example of a so-called quasi-probability distribution. So, as you know, uh, in classical mechanics, you can represent the, uh, let's say, the state of a single particle by a probability density in the phase space. So, the function, which is a function of position and momentum. No problem, right? 
And it's a positively defined probability density is fantastic. In quantum mechanics, you cannot do it because position and momentum do not commute one with another. So there are methods of making the so-called quasi-probability distributions. Perhaps uh, the most famous is the Wigner, which goes back to the 30s. And it's a, it's a function which typically is, or for, RV, let's say for a typical quantum mechanical state, it must have negative parts, which is the expression of the quantumness of this quasi probability distribution. But it has several properties which are similar to uh, probability distribution in particular. First of all, it is normalized. So if you integrate over, it's a function of momentum and position again. Integrated over all variables gives you one but it has negative parts, so it's not really probability density. And uh, integrated over momentum, however, gives you a correct probability density for the position, and vice versa, integrated over position gives you correct probability density for the moment. Uh, there are Wigner functions which are positive, and these are the ones that correspond to the so-called Gaussian state. So if you think about coherent state, I show you Wigner function was just a Gaussian. And this is uh, typical for uh, Gaussian state. So squeeze states have also Wigner functions, which are everywhere positive. They, however, uh, this uh, Wigner functions, even for Gaussian states have limitation because you have the uncertainty principle. So you cannot squeeze the Gaussian in both directions because if you squeeze in one direction, you have to stretch in the other because you have to respect the Heisenberg principle. So this is the feeling. There are other quasi-probability distributions which are very uh, commonly used in quantum optics. One is the famous Glauber's P, rep uh, P representation or P uh, probability uh, uh, quasi probability distribution. This one uh, is considered that when is it positively defined, then you say that the corresponding state of the uh, photons is uh, classical. But uh, for most of the states which are no, non classical, it doesn't really exist in a sense of smooth uh, function. And finally, there is a uh, something which is called Husimi or Q representation, which is always positive. Uh, and it's essentially the average value of the uh, density matrix in coherent states. Uh, and this is also used very often in quantum optics. Um, that's it. And Any other comments, questions? If not, let's thank Machek again. We have a break. And I think we have, yeah, a couple of minutes just to get the battle set up. Um, and I think there are poster boards. So if you've got your poster today, maybe go and set that up so it's ready to go. And then we'll reconvene uh, in a few minutes time with the battle. Um, okay, so we're going to start um, the third quantum battle uh, or panel discussion, uh, and this one will be devoted to the theme that uh, Majek already addressed also in his tutorial this morning and that we've been hearing a lot about this week, uh, how quantum is Atto. Um, now, Um, okay, so I want to introduce the four panelists to uh, four panelists to you. Uh, first of all, uh, Antonia Freiberg. She's a PhD student at the Max Planck Institute for Structure and Dynamics of Matter in Hamburg, where she's doing her PhD project at the moment, uh, working on simulating time-resolved X-ray spectroscopy using wave packet dynamics. Uh, second panelist is Diptesh Day. Uh, he's a postdoctoral researcher at Northwestern University, and he studies nuclear and electron dynamic, electronic dynamics of a molecule following the absorption of light. Uh, third panel, panelist is Lidice Cruz. Uh, she's a postdoctoral researcher at UCL, working with Carla on approaches to model electron dynamics in strong laser fields. 
Uh, and then finally, the fourth panelist is Philip Stammer. He's a PhD student working with Macek at ICFO. And as we have already seen in the tutorial, he's working on quantum optical approaches towards a uh, description of harmonic generation. Now, the way that the panelists have prepared for this is uh, they each have prepared a short presentation about 10 minutes long. Uh, so we're going to hear these presentations one after the other. And then uh, in each case, we'll have a short discussion uh, something like uh, up to five minutes or so immediately after this to basically uh, discuss a few points that have come up as a result of their presentation. Also, they will ask a few questions during or immediately after the presentation. Um, uh, these uh, questions you can get involved in, especially the same system that was used uh, yesterday. This Menti uh, website will be used. Uh, so please, if you want to take part in this, Make sure that you have an internet connection or that your internet connection is activated. There is Wi-Fi here in the room. And here on this piece of paper, you see the password for the Wi-Fi connection. So please make sure that you're set up for that if you want to take part. So we're going to uh, go through the four presentations. And then after that, we will still have a general discussion, uh, basically seeing how, uh, you know, what kind of discussion points have, uh, have come up. Okay, so with that, I'm done with my introduction and I hand the floor to Antonia, who will make the first presentation. Okay, so now better? Okay. Yes. Okay. So, um, yeah, in this context, we are mainly interested in describing the nuclear and electronic motion. And for this purpose, we generally have a broad spectrum of methodologies available, ranging from classical methods over mixed quantum classical descriptions to a full quantum mechanical treatment. And here, the, the choice of the method we use is mainly dependent on the level of accuracy we want to reach, where, of course, a full quantum mechanical treatment gives us the highest level of accuracy. However, just because we solve a certain problem using quantum mechanics does not necessarily mean that the origin of our problem is intrinsically quantum. So actually, as soon as we are able to describe a certain phenomenon using classical mechanics, it's not quantum anymore. So only if classical mechanics fail to give a correct description, uh, the origin of a, of, a, of a phenomenon is really quantum for me. So we already seen this. Um, so if we talk about molecules or molecular motion, um, we have different time scales depending on um, whether we are interested in the nuclear or in the electronic dynamics. And also, of course, the wavelength in our experiment determine which transition can be detected and thus what aspects of a reaction can be monitored. And um, yeah, in photochemistry, we can roughly categorize um, the reaction dynamics into different time scales where the nuclear dynamics, such as conic intersection dynamics and bond breaking information is referred to the femto or picosecond time scale, while the intrinsic time of electronic motion is as fast as atto seconds. So as we all know, we can directly address electronic motion using atto second pulses. And also due to the large spectral bandwidth, we are able to prepare a manifold of electronic states and can thus initiate coherent electron dynamics. So I would say the, the goal of um, studying photochemical reaction dynamics in Arto science would be to, to excite or to remove an electron in a complex molecular system and subsequently follow how this initial photo excitation triggers the electronic dynamics, which in turn reveals the nuclear dynamics and new photo products. So uh, already more than 10 years ago, um, the evolution of an um, electron hole in Krypton atoms was uh, studied experimentally. So here they used near infrared pulses to, to ionize krypton and yeah, preparing the, the cation and the um, um, spin orbits with states. And the energy separation between these states was about 700 milli e volt, um, corresponding to a um, oscillation period of the electron hole of about six femtoseconds. And yeah, this periodic oscillation was then probed using attosecond XEV pulses and were, um, was detected as core to valence transitions, as we can see 
uh, here in the absorption spectrum on the left hand side. On the right hand side, we see an example we have already seen several times during the last two days. Um, so, um, and there the ultra fast charge um, migration was studied in phenylalanine, so a more complex molecular system. So, how can we describe these processes of such as charge migration. So after ionization, um, a hole is created in the molecule and this hole can oscillate from one end to the other um, until the interplay between the nuclear and electronic dynamics leads to a final localization of the charge and um, um, yeah, at a specific part of the molecule. So here in the, <clears throat> in the paper, I mean, I guess uh, we all know the study um, from the Lanceda Biomontis group. They uh, studied the ultra fast positive charge migration um, um, of a dipeptide. And as we can see, initially a hole was created at one end of the molecule, and then it migrates over to the other end within just a few femtoseconds. And um, yeah, this process of general charge migration is driven by coherent electrodynamics, where we have. Um, where we must um, take into account both the purely electronic correlation as well as the electronuclear correlation. So um, in terms of potential energy surfaces, what we do is we initially create a coherent superposition of electronic excited states with a particular phase relationship. And as this superposition forms a non stationary wave packet, it immediately starts to evolve which in turn leads to or, or can influence the um, degree of coherence. So actually, um, or in particular, lots of coherence can be can be caused by the fast spread of the nuclear wave packet and, and the speed of decoherence is um, influenced by the relative shape of the um, potential energy surfaces. So this is also demonstrated here in the figure on the left hand side where we see uh, one dimensional cuts along one version in normal mode. And what we see is, okay, we, we have an excitation to the cathodic state manifold, and then the wave packet starts to evolve. So this is shown in orange. And um, what you see is that if, if, if the um, cathodic states have, have very similar or even identical shape, then the wave packets move collectively. So we have a large spatial overlap and thus a high degree of coherence throughout the propagation. On the other hand, if you have different gradients and different curvature, then we would expect um, having um, a, a decrease of the spatial overlap and thus a decrease as a direct consequence. So this also demonstrates the importance of including nuclear dynamics when studying coherent electron dynamics. But um, yeah, many, especially earlier studies on charge migration only focus on the electronic part and completely neglect the nuclear motion, which were justified by the assumption that they occur on different time scales. But we already heard in several talks that the, the electronic and nuclear motion are highly correlated and we have to take both into account if we want to get the full picture. So in his, um, an example from um, Robert Santo and his group where they studied um, phenylalanine. So they considered two cationic states, the HOMA and the HOMA minus one with a 50-50 superposition. And they showed that there's a almost completely decoherence after just one, uh, yeah, after just one femtoseconds as a direct consequence um, of including all vibrational decoherence, uh, all vibrational degrees of freedom. Um, Another aspect um, is how we prepare our manifold of electronic states. So um, often we just use a certain superposition of the electronic um, states leading to a perfectly coherent wave packet at the beginning. But of course, the parent ion and photoelectron interacts with each other. But, um, and we also heard this in two talks yesterday and also in the tutorial of magic. Um, and yeah, here um, in this study, again, Robin Sandra and his group, um, they ionized xenon and they watched the um, degree of coherence. So um, in this figure, they plotted the degree of coherence depending on the pulse duration against time. And what we see that is that um, at time zero, 
and we get a high degree of coherence for very short pulses. So if, if our child if a pulse is short enough, such that the um, um, spectral bandwidth is larger than the energy separation between the states, then we will have a high degree of coherence. But if we look at the time after one femtoseconds, we see that we actually get a maximum of a degree of coherence for pulse length between 20 and 30 attoseconds. And this is due to the entanglement between the parent ion and the photoelectron. So we already heard yesterday that um, there's decoherence due to entanglement. And um, in the same study, they, um, they also gave a simple solution. So um, they showed that the simplest solution is to make the photoelectron an, an average faster. So making them quickly enough such that the entanglement between the parent ion and the photoelectron gets suppressed. Of course, if you go to larger system, we will also have environmental effects or temperature effects and so on. So there, there are really much going on and it's, it can be hard to, to take everything into account. And we, we, of course, have to make a decision how we want to treat our systems. So go, coming back to the better question, how quantum is at, I want to ask you a very fundamental question. So um, it's a bit slower, I, yeah. So I want to ask you, what is the nature of electronic coherence? And okay, you have to open your browser and go to menti.com and then you have to um, use this number, then you can vote. Okay, but I think we're seeing a quite clear conclusion. Right? Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> okay. I mean, I, I would say we can stop the power, right? And yeah, I leave the outcome as it is because now I'm curious what Diptish has to say about um, classical description on electronic coherence. Uh, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Carla and the organizers for this uh, opportunity. And uh, coming to... In the corner, there's uh, 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 I don't <laughs> 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 Uh, yeah, so coming to the question like how quantum is at all. The way I see it is, uh, so my background is related to chemistry. We looked into nuclear dynamics and electron dynamics. So for me, uh, if something happens on the time scale, on the time scale of 10 to the power minus 15 second, it's, uh, we call it like femtosecond dynamics or uh, 
like we look in process which are related to nuclear dynamics and then if some process happens on the time scale of uh, 10 to the minus 18 second it's like uh, for me it's like at a second process and we usually look into coherent uh, electron dynamics so the processes can be uh, several like charge migration which already antonia and uh, in our like meeting we already discussed about that uh, it can be tunnel ionization or there are like multi photon processes so uh yeah there, there can be others Multiphoton processes like a uh, high harmonic generation, above threshold ionization, sequential or non sequential double ionization. And uh, people can also look into applications of this kind of laser pulses in uh, controlling uh, like the electron motion, which is like kind of vital in chemistry. So, uh, coming back to charge migration, the way it became so interesting in recent years is because of some studies which are like kind of controversial. So, the first study it says like there is the evidence of wave-like electron transfer through quantum coherence in photosynthetic systems. But the other one, it says like nature doesn't rely on long-lived electronic uh, quantum coherence for photosynthetic energy transfer. So this is basically related to these FMO complexes, whether energy transfer is, uh, is, is happening there via charge uh, electronic coherence or not. So this is basically a little bit of background. And... Uh, Coming back to a poll, which if you would like to participate and address like what you think about which numerical method is ideal to capture electronic coherence accurately. So I think we, yeah, we understood it like uh, from, from like the talk of uh, Mark Bracking, Marco and others. Uh, quantum mechanical descriptors are, uh, are, are probably the best methods. Uh, but in my uh, presentation, so I am also, I, I'm, I'm basically, I, 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 I solved time dependent Schrodinger equation. And the way or the reason I solve it is because I have a chemistry background. So we, from the beginning, we are taught to solve that thing instead of going to classical methods. It's like a nail and hammer thing. So here I'm going to give a, uh, a picture of in the other direction. Like if we don't go in that, in that picture, in like solving the uh, uh, Schrodinger equation or quantum equivalent solution, what benefit you can get or what information can we get? So I agree with the, with the poll and then. So here I'm going to give some examples which are done by other research groups. So this is from the group of Giri Vanichek from EPFL, Lausanne. So they did a study of uh, studying uh, charge migration. So uh, till now we understood like charge migration is, uh, is a process that can be, uh, that can stay longer or for lesser time depending on factors like uh, decoherence, which is governed by, let's say nuclear motion or like the ejected photoelectron. So this is for the uh, nuclear motion induced electronic uh, decoherence for a molecule called propylic acid. It's like, uh, you can think like carbon triple bond and carboxylic acid molecule, containing molecule. So in this study, they, sh they use different theoretical methods or models. Uh, so the one in red is basically a full quantum solution using MCDDH, which is a grid-based method on this fibronic coupling Hamiltonian. Uh, and then they compared with, with uh, other methods, which are like semi-classical. Uh, the, the yellow one is, uh, they call it third Gaussian approximation, 
which if you can read at the bottom, it's like a simple single trajectory semi-classical scheme to capture the electronic coherence. So it is basically, a, uh, as I understand, it's a Gaussian wave packet. They uh, propagate the center of the wave packet. The, the, it, it follows that trajectory and then they calculate the width uh, and parameters. So this they have done using diabetic potentials and adiabatic potentials in yellow and blue. And uh, they also look into the on the fly trajectory because sometimes in these grid based methods, the problem is to calculate the potential surface over the whole grid. And they, the results showed like for five femtosecond, uh, around five femtosecond to 10 femtosecond, there is good match for the red, yellow, and the blue lines. And then there's a deviation. So uh, the conclusion they came up is like for shorter time scales. So assuming like this uh, electronic coherence will last for 10 femtosecond or less. So maybe the other methods can be good enough. And uh, so if there is some challenges regarding calculating the potential surface, one can look into also the on the fly methods. So this is uh, again, like for a particular system. So uh, it, 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 it might not be valid for other systems, but also keeping in mind that for bigger systems, or bigger molecules, one might need to go for approximate or methods which are like uh, mixed quantum classicals or semi-classical or classical. So here there is another poll, uh, which is uh, which numerical method is more suitable to capture electronic coherence now for polyatomic or or let's say biological systems. What do you think? So I think uh, we still have a little bit uh, yeah, more more vote on these mixed quantum classical descriptions. So for, by now, I think I am able to convince a little bit like uh, maybe this, uh, if, we, if we slightly change our problem and like try to look into approaches, which is not exactly uh, like uh, taking into account all the effects, but maybe most of the effects. So maybe approaches like uh, mixed quantum classical descriptions are good, which also like uh, in the talk, Fernando Martin, he showed like for small systems, like for exact methods and then slowly we can look into uh, solving like electron uh, quantum mechanically or nuclear uh, nuclear motion classically. So I, I agree with this. And then if we move forward. So uh, this is another example from the group of uh, Robin Santra uh, sometime back uh, in, I think the paper is 27. Uh, maybe the, the citation is, I, I'm not sure it's right. It's, it should be 2017 or 2015. Anyways, so uh, so here what they did, so they looked into uh, surface hopping calculations using classical photoelectron and uh, bound quantum electrons and the nuclei uh, classically. So it's a surface hopping calculation. And then they tried to calculate this part, this decoherence due to this, uh, uh, the, the ejected electron on this uh, molecular cation. And uh, they they showed, if you see the panel D, that's for moving nuclei. So there is a sharp decrease in the coherence in the first 50 attosecond. And, but in the longer run, it doesn't play much role. That was their result. And uh, also uh, they pointed out it's a slow photoelectron that's uh, playing the key role. Uh, so, uh, so coming to this question, whether the semi-classical modeling is good enough, they also showed uh, the bottom uh, corner plot where they compared like uh, quantum calculations with, uh, with surface hopping. And it showed like, even if the photoelectron is not taken into account, uh, there is a difference between quantum calculation and the surface hopping method. So uh, exact quantum and uh, the um, surface hopping uh, mixed quantum classical method. So the question comes here, which method to choose? And also like, uh, uh, so from the talk of Marco, we understood like probably the be best way to, to do a belt test, but then if it is not suitable for bigger systems, so if this kind of methods can be suitable to carry, uh, like to, to give the picture or how the effect is, uh, is coming into account. 
so after this work i think i didn't see any any further work from their group but this is probably uh, yeah one important work to give us this idea about the effect of the photoelectron on this uh, decodence and this was for water cation molecule so if we move forward uh, i think this is my last poll so So this is on what is the origin of this correlation between this ejected photoelectron and the parent ion. So people think uh, it's purely quantum, more people think, I think I'll, I'll go for it. <laughs> but still like, uh, there it, uh, so th there, are, there are a certain number of people who also think like it has both qu quantum and classical origins. Uh, so I think uh, it's, it's, it's a good way of modeling, but uh, I don't know if it is able to capture the complete picture. So uh, changing gears, now I'll show you some results uh, done by different groups on uh, other effects like uh, sequential double ionization, which is on the top, and non sequential double ionization, which is on the bottom. So, it might happen the, the light hits that atom or molecule and then it ejects uh, two electrons. If the electrons are like correlated, uh, then it's uh, non sequential, and if it is correlated, it's not more related. Let's say the laser pulse hits, one electron goes out first, and then it comes back and hits the other one. So, we'll call it like non sequential. So the first example uh, it shows, so they have used, uh, they, they have compared with the experimental numbers. The reason I chose this, these things is, uh, these, are, these are like from the random papers, but they have a little bit of comparison with experiment and theory, which is kind of a guide for, for us to choose which, which kind of method to choose. So the first one at the uh, right, right top, uh, sorry, left top. So it has uh, two, they use two different methods, which they call it HPCM and SPCM. So the, the SPCM is basically, or the, these two methods are basically how they model the, uh, the Coulomb potential. So, uh, so in the HPCM, they take into account that the electron will not sit in the nuclei so that it avoids this auto ionization stuff. So they found that this kind of method model, which is like classical ensemble model, it can simulate uh, non sequential double ionization for argon for elliptically polarized pulses. And the intensity, so the reports are like on the intensity dependent release times of the two electrons, which agree very well with the experimental data. And it also predicts, which I have not shown here, is also predicts the oscillatory behavior of the parallel to anti-parallel electron emissions as a function of uh, the intensity. So this, this brings us to the question uh, that, uh, so, so, so if, if we think about electron correlation or uh, like electron nuclear, couple electron nuclear motion, those are to me like, exact quant or the quantum descriptions, but whether approaches which are not quantum, they are able to capture the methods or not. So uh, the, the reason also I put it is uh, this examples is that the question is like how quantum is at all. So I thought of going a little on the other direction and try to find some ways to answer this question, uh, like in a, in a reverse way, whether this approaches, so it might happen that there are, there are quantum mechanical effects, but maybe the effects are not much. So in that sense, maybe these methods like uh, classical or semi-classical methods, they can take into account. But from the uh, title, they say like classical simulations, including electron correlation. So uh, I, because I am not an expert in that area, so I don't know how they describe this thing. Coming to the second part. So the bottom uh, right plot. So they uh, looked into double peak structure of final momentum distributions of non-sequential double ionization ions. And they choose ions like neon, helium, argon for different intensities. They have showed the plots. And these, uh, I think the experiments are using this cold target recoil ion momentum spectroscopy. And they uh, predicts four stages of non-sequential double ionization, the initiation, recollision, ionization, and jitter phase. So here, uh, 
the way they interpret the results, the experimental results in dots, black dots, is that they draw these lines in uh, in red uh, bold lines and these uh, blue dot uh, uh, lines. So, and they try to interpret that sometimes it, it might arise from non-zero, which is a red one, or the zero momentum of these uh, of these uh, ejected ions. Mm, so, and, and it depends the contribution, whether like in the first case, in like A, maybe the non-zero contribution is more than the zero. So there is like this uh, valley and then maybe the contribution is same or the contribution of the zero is more. So, so based on this, they give an, like an idea or interpretation of the results. So I think uh, the talk from uh, Manfred Lane, we, we, I think the way he said, like he was doing quantum cal cal calculations, but at the same time, in order to understand some process, people can shift a little bit to the classical models or semi-classical models and just to look into the trajectory and to understand what is going on inside. So to me, these methods can serve as an alternative in situations where quantum mechanical calculations are challenging if it's a bigger system. And also if we are not able to catch the, like what's going on with the, with the, with the electron or the, or the, or the, uh, or the dynamics part. So this can serve them as an alternative. That's what I wanted to point out. And this uh, here, they say that these classical methods can interpret multi-electron effects, which I think maybe for these systems, it's applicable, maybe for not for the other systems. So the last example we, uh, which I'm going to show is basically uh, because these laser pulses can be used to, uh, to control or monitor this electron motion. So this is basically a work on CP control which has been, uh, a, a lot of work has been done on this direction because this uh, carrier envelope phase, if you see in this plot on the yellow uh, on the right uh, top. So it's basically, if you change the phase and then it can influence the electron motion and it, 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 it affects also process like uh, above threshold ionization or the direction of electron emission, which are in these uh, uh, references. So uh, the, the reason I choose this plot is because it gives a pictorial visualization what it happens. So with this CP, one can see like uh, along the Z coordinate of this H2 plus, the electron oscillates and uh, it, it finally leads to electron localization and fragmentation and the electron oscillates back and forth between the nuclei uh, before, yeah, before it goes to either of the channels. So quantum mechanical, this is the quantum mechanical calculations uh, solving the Schrodinger equation. So, uh, so this, I think for small molecules or one electron systems, it's, it's doable. So the question which, came to my mind whether we can use this kind of models or say, uh, like uh, we can look into CP effects for uh, using semi-classical models. So there was a work from uh, Kansas State uh, uh, group. So where they argued that uh, this CP, the origin of the CP effect is basically the interference from two, like uh, the N photon channels. Mm, so in that sense, maybe it will not be able to take into account the interference effect, but maybe if it's, it, if it's, uh, so it's, it's, it's a question to address like whether the CP effect can be modeled with these uh, semi-classical models uh, in, in contrast to like, uh, the exact solution. So I'm going to stop, uh, but I just wanted to point out that the calculations we did or we presented or uh, we, we do, or uh, uh, so it's basically take into account the classical description of light and the semi-classical or classical or quantum description of matter, depending upon like uh, the problem of choice. So we don't look into the quantum behavior of nature because of light because of uh, this, uh, the light, we think like it's a multi-photon process, it contains a lot of photons. So uh, we, do, we, we, we are not sure if we really need to quantize the light, but then I think uh, so like from today's talk, we understood like maybe that might be also important. And our colleague, like he will, he might point out some of these things on this direction. So I think with this, I'll uh, hand over to uh, ladies, but yeah, questions. Okay, so we've heard a lot about uh, electronic coherences. Uh, we've also heard about decoherence processes, uh, that, that limited duration over which these electronic coherences may be observable. Um, we've heard that there's an important question. I mean, is the nature of these electronic coherences, is, should we really think of this as a quantum mechanical problem or is it something that we can also understand in a classical way? Uh, if we want to treat this, uh, numerically, should we necessarily resort to quantum mechanical methods, or can we also make some progress with uh, classical methods? Uh, and maybe, uh, so we now have a short time for discussion, uh, and maybe one question that I first would like to put on the table. We had this very uh, interesting poll, right? I mean, what is the 
uh, origin of the correlation between uh, electrons and ions. And it seems that in the audience, there was sort of an even split between people uh, saying this is a purely quantum mechanical effect uh, or uh, this effect is a, is a mixture of, of quantum mechanical uh, and, and classical uh, effects. So my question is, I mean, how, how, how do we get out of this situation? I mean, how do we decide <laughs> which of these two answers is the correct one? Or maybe if I can ask the question like this, I mean, is there a correct answer to this question? I mean, is there a universal answer to this question that always applies? Is that something that I can ask you to comment? Yes, uh, I think, uh, yeah, the, the, the way I designed the like question is to, yeah, take the attention of the audience. But for to me, uh, it's it's quantum mechanical. So there is, yeah. So there is no way around. So because we, yeah, I, I tend to agree that it is quantum mechanical. Now you can, of course, have any kind of approximation that will classical mechanics. If you do what you need to be done, will mimic quantum mechanics more or less. So. You may want to use classical method, but the point is that you will pay such a price with classical method that if you want to do it right, I'm not sure you gain anything on computer time or uh, facility or easiness of the approach. So if I look at the closed uh, system, like an atom or whatever, and so I have uh, ions, I have electrons and so on. And uh, in principle, it is described by the wave function. So of course, any uh, correlation is described quantum mechanically. It comes from quantum mechanics, comes from the fact that there is entanglement between these different parts of the system. Now, if I look only on one electron, let's say, and the parent ion, the reduced density matrix for that, which doesn't contain other electrons, can be separable. That means it can be completely classical in the sense of correlation and does not uh, and can not can be not containing any uh, quantum mechanical correlation. So I think it very much depends on the on the on the concrete situations. Okay. Actually, if I can briefly add to that, I, I, I very much agree with this statement, and I think actually the last problem that you showed is a very nice illustration of this right right i mean if you look at the problem of electron localization in an in an ion that is dissociating i mean if you look at this in a condition where entanglement between the ion and the photoelectron plays a role then of course you're completely screwed if you try to do this with a classical method right that's never going to work um however if you can perform such an experiment under conditions where entanglement doesn't play a role, and that's actually the, the case in the example that you show there, right? I mean, there is just an H2 plus ion that is being launched on a dissociative curve and that keeps interacting with, with, a, with a laser pulse. That is a situation that you can describe very, very nicely with semi-classical methods, and you will almost exactly reproduce quantum results. Uh, so it really, I, I agree, it depends very much on the situation. Yeah, I, in my case, I think that, um, yeah, um, what, what I, in my uh, personal, uh, what, what I personally do is that I make the calculations quantum mechanically, but many times for uh, understanding what, 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 why I find such a coherence effect, I calculate semi-classical trajectories and I see the, the, the motion and when, when, the, when it might happen, this coherence at what time that, those two trajectories might interfere, but not, not for calculation, but more for interpretation, the semi-classical approach. I'll yes. just make a quick comment. I think a big issue also in our community is that people struggle to agree on a definition of semi-classical because, I mean, you have raised a very nice point that uh, for interpretational reasons, semi-classical trajectories are important, uh, but they should retain some quantum effects like quantum interference. But I've seen many times that semi-classical is referred to what actually would be classical or quasi-classical, because then in the method, they just put uh, some kind of tunneling rate and all the rest is classical and many things are neglected uh, during the computation. 
So, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, and, and then before we continue, there's maybe also a second question that I would like to ask, and that then goes more in the direction of what uh, Antonia was discussing. Um, you remember that earlier this week, we had a presentation by John Marangos. It's a pity that he's not here today. Uh, but basically reporting on these uh, very exciting experiments that they did at LCLS. And one of the statements that John made is that uh, electronic coherence may be really important because the light that comes to us from the sun has a coherence time of one femtosecond. So maybe during that one femtosecond, electronic coherence uh, uh, plays a role. Um, so that is something that I would like to ask you, Antonia. Uh, I mean, is electronic coherence something that just plays a role in our laboratories, the moment that we do our pump probe experiments, or is it something that we can really connect to processes that are happening in nature? Um, well, I mean, we have also seen these studies, um, did the show in his presentation, um, where electronic coherence effects were measured in a large biological system, so they they measured the electronic coherence in this famous FMO complex, which played a huge role in biology. So, I mean, for me, it's so the discussion in Liptish mentioned is more on how long does this co electronic coherence last. But for me, it's remarkable by itself that we can measure quantum effects in biological systems. If we go to the question, okay. Does it influence the biological functionality? I don't know if there's a direct consequence. I mean, there are several steps in between, but um, if we go to the direction where we want to get control over nature, using other second pulses, of course, we have to consider these quantum effects also in larger biological systems. So yes, I would say there it's important. Uh, so I, yeah, I think uh, that like the temperature also should be important. Like yeah, yeah what temperature conditions we are considering, like in the lab or in the like in the biological systems. But in that room temperature, they measured the electronic coherence. Yes, yes, yes. I mean, the question is so long, but they were able to study. Concerning biological system, I think we we have also to take into account that later on during the time evolution, you may have conical intersections and then you will create coherence. And so it's not necessarily the coherence you created with the initial excitation. And so people are very puzzled because they say they cannot have be any coherence on a picosecond time scale, but maybe you just create it on that picosecond time scale, right? And then it's a completely different ballpark. But if we do not have quantum method at this moment, we are missing the effect for sure, right? And so for a theorist, it's a big uh, nightmare because we, we cannot be quantum uh, all the time. And it's not clear at all how to switch back to quantum from semi-classical or what we can do. But for me, it's the toughest question, right? It's what happens at longer time that can be fully quantum and that we miss because we, we just, compute the first, at most, 100 femtosecond quantum. Uh, uh, anybody else who would like to comment on this question? Okay, uh, let's keep thinking about it a little bit and let's maybe continue with the presentations. Uh, and the next presenter will be Lidic. Okay, it's really like this, yeah? yeah. Okay, well, I'm going to speak now about something completely different, not related with what Antonia and Diptesh uh, have presented. I also would like to thank uh, the organizers for uh, this uh, different conference. It has been a really uh, nice experience. And when we started talking, um, I will skip this slide. When we started talking about the battle and how quantum is atom, the first question we asked among us was uh, what quantum mean, uh, means for us. And I think in this, we kind of agree that we say something is quantum when you don't have any classical analog to this phenomena, like uh, tunneling is a quantum phenomena. We cannot explain tunneling with a, what I will call the classical uh, physical law. 
And the next thing I will uh, assume, and I'm not sure if Philip will agree with me, is that for me to describe the electron dynamics, I need to solve the time dependent Schrodinger equation. By this, I mean this is a pure quantum thing. But of course, as we have said many times, we cannot always solve it. So we use approaches, semi classical approaches. Why? Because they make our life easier and also because we look at trajectories and we can understand the world better if you if we see if we see things moving and then i want to bring to the table today a method that uh, i don't think is very popular is bohmian mechanics bohmian mechanics uh, has the property or the i don't know how to say that is a fully quantum thing is a completely equivalent to the time dependent Schrodinger equation but we have trajectories so we can use the power of the trajectories like we can understand the dynamics but we still have the full quantum solution of the problem this is the theory the practice is very bad because it's really really difficult to actually solve the equation of motion of the bohmian trajectories and as i know this is not a very popular thing the first that this is the last uh, poll we will have in this presentation i want to know what do you know about Bohmian mechanics? Because the rest, I'm going to say, depends on that. Okay, I think uh, it might be useful what I'm going to say <laughs> for the people who know nothing. <laughs> so we have a few experts. I apologize to them. <laughs> Carla probably is an expert. She knows. I'm going to present some of your work here. Yeah. Okay, people are still voting, I can move. So I will say the majority, they don't know anything about Bohmian mechanics. This was my case when I started my PhD. I didn't know this was a theory. I didn't know this was anything. And so hopefully I will kind of introduce this quickly and to explain why this is fully equivalent to the time dependent Schrodinger equation. So the starting point, Bohmian mechanics is also known as the hydrodynamic formulation of quantum mechanics. And the starting point, uh, hopefully I would not, uh, what is the pointer? It doesn't work. <laughs> okay, so we start from the time dependent Schrodinger equation. We propose an ansatz for the wave function in terms of an amplitude and a phase. We plug these ansatz, ansatz into the wave function into the time dependent Schrodinger equation and we separate real imaginary part and we arrive to this set of four hydrodynamic equations. The first one is a continuity equation and will give you the time evolution of the probability density. And the second one looks like the Hamilton-Jacobi equation that we have in classical mechanics. But there is a term which I name Q and they call this the quantum potential. Why potential? Because it's similar to, it, it enters the equation in the same way the classical potential. And why quantum? Because it's a non-local potential. It depends on the probability density. The third equation is like the Newton equation, but we have the gradient of the quantum potential, and this is the quantum force. And the last equation is the one that brings the concept of trajectories to this theory, because the Bohmian trajectories are the ones that they move, the velocity field is given by the gradient of the phase. If we solve these four equations, we can have the uh, probability, the, uh, the, yeah, the, the probability function and the, and the phase. And with this, we have the wave function, we have all the observables. That's why this is fully equivalent to the time dependent Schrodinger equation. Uh, I will say in natural science, uh, Bohmian mechanics, they are not very popular, but they have been used. And why I think they are relevant for this battle is because through the quantum potential, we can try to understand the nature, like to understand how quantum, what we are seeing 
might be. Uh, the way they are used in, in most of the data science papers I could find uh, found is uh, not actually you don't solve the time dependent Schrodinger equation using Bohmian mechanics. You solve your time dependent Schrodinger equation with whatever method you want to use, and then you get the wave the, the trajectories. Once you have the wave function, you can get the trajectories and you can look at them and you can evaluate the quantum potential and you can try to understand what is going on. Uh, with this introduction, for the sake of time, I will just move to the examples. And this is the first example I, I would like to show you. This is a paper on tunneling ionization. As I say, tunneling is a intrinsic, uh, intrinsically quantum phenomenon. And they solve the time dependent Schrodinger equation for the system. And, and they try to, once they, they have done that, they try to get the Bohmian trajectories and they try to understand what is going on there. And this plot, which uh, on the, this is the left or right, left, I think, uh, this is showing a group of trajectories, how they are driven by the electric field, by the uh, laser pulse. And on the right, you see the acceleration on these trajectories, and the red uh, dashed line is the electric force. But you can see that even at the uh, at the beginning, before the trajectories, they are ionized. They they are different from the electric uh, force, even when they are still in the ground state. Like the, there is no uh, when they are. Uh, there is also be besides the action of the quantum uh, of the interaction potential, there is the action of the quantum potential. Once they are ionized, there is no more interaction with the Coulomb potential, and at some point they just follow the electric field. So this means that at some point these trajectories they stop being quantum, if we want to think about it, there is no more quantum force. They, they completely follow the classical uh, laser field. What is interesting here is they show the energy of the trajectory. So the first thing I would like to comment here is we know tunneling is forbidden in classical mechanics. How this is explained within the Bohmian formulation. You have the quantum potential is exactly the kinetic energy of the trajectories when they tunnel to the uh, to the continuum and they one particular trajectory they they follow here is this trajectory that they okay this is not working number six this is a trajectory that tunnels around 20 uh, atomic units of time and in the plot before we see that it actually follows the uh, electric field at 30 atomic units of, of time so this means that after tunneling there is some time where the trajectory is still different from the, uh, the force is different from the classical force this means there is some quantum force there so my question here this is question i don't have the answer for that is to think about it and we can discuss at the end maybe what does this mean for the tunnel exit theory that is this meaning that after that after the tunnel exit in the, in the problems that for example i solve there are the trajectories are not classical yet we have to include some quantum effects i don't know uh, so this was my first example. I will go to the next one, which is high order harmonic generation, um, where they again look at the quantum force in for different trajectories. They you, you have on the left three different types of trajectories. I will see is a trajectory that just gets uh, ionized, it has nothing to do with the harmonic spectra. A is a trajectory that remains bound. And B is a trajectory that is driven by the field and then com comes back. And these are the ones interesting for the high harmonics. On the left, you see the force on this trajectory, on B. On, in black line is the total force. So you can see at the beginning with the trajectory is in the ground state, there is zero total force. This means, and this is also something that we, we know from the Bohmian mechanics, that at the, in the ground state, classical and quantum force, they are equally uh, same value but opposite that's why the trajectory is in the equilibrium then we come with a field and we start to uh, you know uh, drive the trajectory away from the core and this is where you see the wheels in the total force and then the trajectory comes back and you can see that during the process when the trajectory is coming back the quantum potential the quantum force is the green uh, line there is highly oscillatory and in various I would say that is strong so this means that during this recombination process, the quantum force is not zero. So this means that 
during the recombination, this is quantum. We need to take into account quantum effects. This is the point I, I wanted to make with this figure. Also, there are other studies, uh, studies in higher monics that uh, show this, and I will go to the next one. This is a study by, by Carla uh, and collaborators, where they try to get the harmonic spectra using one or more than one Bohmian trajectories. And they show that if they use only the central Bohmian trajectory, this is on the left, this is the red uh, line on the left, they can uh, reproduce some features on the harmonic spectra, but there is not quantitative agreement. And if they want to, so this, is, this has one important implication. This means that this central trajectory is having some information from the other ones. That's, and this is because the quantum potential is non-local. It depends on the probability distribution. So this is one important thing. And the next thing is that to get a quantitative agreement with a time-dependent showing an equation, they need to consider more Bohmian trajectories, not only the central one, like more a distribution. And this is implying that we have a, some spread that we need to take into account to, to, have the, to get the time-dependent uh, agreement with a a full time dependent showing a solution. So, this is the next example uh, high harmonics. And I would like to go to the last one, which is the auto clock. I admit I am not an expert on the auto clock. I just want to show what they show in this experiment. You might, in this uh, study, you might disagree with what they say. Uh, so, they calculate the momentum distribution and the, uh, also the, like the uh, probability distribution, and they this is the time-dependent cal calculation on the left, and on the right is what they reproduce using Bohmian trajectories. Okay? And then they try to understand from where the spread, the, uh, the spread in this distribution is coming from. And for this, they build this model where they consider, they, they call something they, uh, a transition position. This, this is the R there. And they say, okay, if the trajectory is beyond the transition position, it's classical, there's, it's not quantum anymore, this means your quantum potential is zero, no quantum potential. And what they do is they move the transition, the transition position. They start close to the core or, or to the tunnel exit in the semi-classical models, and they extend that. And when they show, what they obtain is that when you start with a transition uh, position, which is around 12 atomic units, this is the first, the top plot on the left, there is no spreading. This means that you are switching off the quantum potential too soon. Then they start increasing this uh, transition position and uh, E, which is the, they get a good agreement with the time dependent initial calculation. They, this, they have a, I think the transition position was like 30 atomic units. So what they understand from this is that the spreading is coming from the quantum potential and not what uh, was uh, understood from uh, classical trajectory Monte Carlo, quantum trajectory Monte Carlo, that was attrib uh, attributed to the spread of the initial transfer velocity. So this is an interpretation that gives that this is due to the quantum effects. And with this, I think, uh, yes, my message here, because I, I have presented different examples, is like, can we use this theory to try to understand where are the quantum effects, how relevant they are? And I also wanted to recommend this uh, review in, in applied Bohmian mechanics. The, the, from I, I, Angel Sanz is the one I know uh, better working in, in these Bohmian trajectories. They actually, they cover most of the topics where people are using Bohmian mechanics. And I, I think it's a very useful read. And also they show something that is useful for our discussion here. They show how to get the classical limit going from the uh, Bohmian uh, equations. And I think that's the end for Philips. I don't know if you have time for questions now. Okay, yeah, let's have uh, a, a short discussion about what we just heard. So. Uh, this morning, we're questioning, you know, how quantum is more or less everything that we encounter. Uh, here we've seen the quantum potential as an object that carries in its name very clearly that it must be quantum. Um, and I mean, you mentioned a few times that the quantum potential is non-local. Uh, can, you, can you tell us, I mean, how can we recognize this in the expression that you showed? Because, I mean, uh, you say it's, it depends on the, uh, uh, the amplitude or uh, the wave function amplitude. I mean... In principle, that's uh, 
Oh. It's better now? Yeah. So this is the expression for the quantum potential. You can see that there are, it depends on the density. This means that each trajectory, each quantum trajectory knows what is what the other ones are doing because it has the information of the world probability distribution and this is going on the quantum potential. This is for me what it means by non-locality. They are not independent, they, they, they talk to each other. That's what non-local means for me. Hey, hello. <laughs> thank you very much. thank you um can you educate us a little bit i mean how different are these trajectories from the trajectories that we might have seen in semi-classical treatments i would say they are completely different uh, in the semi-classical treatments uh, to my knowledge what you do is you have some information about the maybe the initial like this <laughs> <laughs> you have some information about the initial distribution and you try to put this in the trajectories, but what you propagate afterwards is classical equations of motion. And mm -hmm. these Bohmian trajectories, first of all, the, the initial distribution of them is given by the wave function, the probability distribution, but also while they are propagating, your wave function is, ev is evolving in time and you get, at each time, you have a new quantum potential and this quantum potential is Inter is making these trajectories interact. So you have, during the wall dynamics, you have the information of how the wave function is, and this is acting in the trajectories. Okay. Uh, do we have anybody else who would like to make a comment or who has a question about this? Yeah. What also I think it's important is that when people in our field think about trajectories or things leaving and coming back, they have a picture of very classical entities as uh, just say saying and this had this work on high harmonics with the central trajectory has led to a great deal of controversy but you understand what is going on for instance if you look at the time profile of that central trajectory you see that the time profile you get are arch-like structures which resemble an ensemble of classical trajectories and what people in our field don't think a lot about is that when you have all these classical trajectories, you put them in the phase via the action. So what you have is you have a lot of quantum pathways that are being mimicked by that, but it doesn't mean literally that you have a classical trajectory leaving and coming back. It means that you have this uh, action and you have all those pathways and uh, you are mimicking what is going on uh, using a classical trajectory. But if you take something in the middle, and look at high harmonics and you get a plateau and a cutoff, it's clearly that this entity is not classical. And more, if you check, uh, I mean, you may think, okay, nothing is leaving and coming back, but this is a totally different story. Because at the end of the day, you would have from the phases that are being passed on via the other trajectories and the quantum potential that is not local, these arch-like structures which resemble what you would get from an ensemble of classical trajectories leaving and coming back. So, you know, is the question how quantum is at all and how much people internalize in terms of classical trajectories that, I mean, is actually not classical, it is a means of getting some information and, and looking at interference, but they're not really okay, we have something classical that is doing this and this and that. The, uh, there is a book by Xavier Muriel and Jordi Mombard, which was published in 2019 on applied Bohmian mechanics, which is probably more actual than the European Physical Journal, I guess. So I recommend it. It was in CRC Press. Um, 
Okay, so we need to move on to the last presentation. But before we do, there's maybe one question that I would I'd like to ask you, Lidice, that you can perhaps think about uh, the next 10 minutes. I will not ask you to answer the question now. Um, so in the first two presentations, we heard a lot about electronic coherence, uh, you know, how we can observe it, uh, when, it's, when it occurs, uh, how we calculate it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, can you uh, formulate an answer to how Bohmian mechanics can help us with addressing this question? If at all possible. Okay. Okay. Um, but can you actually? Yeah. Yeah. That's like, do we need the mic? So. Okay, but then uh, here it might be way too. But just like this. Okay. But can you see when I'm sitting here the the whole screen? Yes. Okay. Perfect. Like an ice cream. Yeah. Okay, perfect. So, um, so far, uh, we have seen uh, very nice presentations about the discussion of coherence correlation in our electron and the ion. So now we will have a different uh, perspective on the whole uh, how quantum is Atto question. Thank you. No, no, for back and forth, yes, it does work. Great. Okay. So uh, now we will uh, look from the perspective if we quantize the field. We have beautifully seen before um, the discussion about the yeah, correlation, coherence between uh, the electron or entanglement with the ion. And now uh, we will one step further from just looking at the semi-classical perspective where the laser field or the harmonic field mode as well are all treated um, classically. We will now consider full quantum optical approaches to the process for high harmonic generation. And I want to yeah, give you some perspective about the, the question, how quantum is Atto, from my point of view, in particular, talking about the process of high harmonic generation. But I think before um, we yeah, answer or look at the process of high harmonic generation, we have to ask ourselves what is underlying the question of how quantum is Atto. First of all, when I heard about the question, um, I was really super happy to, to hear the question because to me, it's something really deep to my heart. So thank you for proposing this question. And first I thought it's an ontological question. So what is the, the ontological nature of the processes we investigate in auto second science? And from my perspective, first of all, there's in general no difference between a classical and a quantum world. It's the same world external to me. But then I later on realized in all the discussions we had, it might be a bit more suitable for for this meeting and also for uh, yeah not ending in a highly ontological debate with all the people participating that I more talk about the question how do we classify our observations and there that's what I first want to uh, briefly talk about so does it okay so maybe first uh, from my point of view how do we distinguish in terms of classification between quantum and classical first of all i want to emphasize uh, here i'm speaking from the perspective as an instrumentalist or as much would like to call me radical empirist uh, so for me there's no uh, first of all no single one-to-one -one description between experiment and theory so even though if we only had one description for our our empirical data doesn't mean that there is not even a other existing descriptions we might have not envisioned yet. So uh, that's why I always uh, emphasize imagination. There should be no limit for it. But uh, so theory may do everything, but except to think that it has the quality to explain our phenomena. So as an instrumentalist, I don't look for explanations of the phenomena we observe. I just want to classify my observations. So the ontological fallacy within the theory is to expect that there's a corresponding reality to the objects we describe with our mathematical framework. So the connection between the preparation and the detection is the important part, but how I connect my detection and my preparation, this is completely arbitrary. So uh, therefore I want to emphasize that we ideally look for a model independent way. And uh, this is important because an explanation, whatever explanation we use always includes a point of view. So if we start, for instance, uh, to treat our um, description uh, with the Schrödinger equation, we have already took the point of view of being in a classical description because we have started with the Schrödinger equation. So ideally, we want to classify our observations model independent, 
because the model includes the point of view, but the pure empirical data does not. The data always just includes the measurement setup. So yeah, data does not, data includes the measurement setup. So we first need to define an observer perspective and based on our observable, we can then argue how to classify this observation and is there a classical uh, way to classify uh, what I observe empirically. So um, if we use the classical description, for instance, classical probability theory, we are scientists. So uh, we do empirical science and physics. Probability theory is one of our most powerful tools. And quantum mechanics, to some extent, is just a way to compute these uh, empirical probabilities we observe. So for me, it's not a quantum effect if we have a classical probability distribution which can capture the whole empirical phenomena. And therefore, for instance, wave interference as uh, an electron considered being a wave is a purely classical phenomena for me because it's just a wave phenomena. And this we have known from classical physics for a very long time. So now to finally start uh, talking about other second science, in particular, starting to talk about the process of harmonic generation. There has been a beautiful work um, also by other people, except from the group of Marciak, in particular uh, from Technion or in Koenis here. And uh, in the most uh, simplest approach to describe the process of harmonic generation uh, with the quantum optical description, we have heard from Marcik in this morning, we do all these unitaries, and then we do this conditioning on the ground state in the approach uh, we are using in our group. And what comes out uh, if we do uh, the mathematical deduction is that the quantity which is coupled to our field operators is the expectation value of the dipole moment. This we have heard from Marcik um, this morning that uh, we then, if we solve our dynamics for the field modes, get product coherent states. Product coherent states are classical. And this is due to the fact because we have only considered the expectation value of the dipole moment operator. So if you start switching from the dipole moment as an operator going to the dipole moment expectation value, you have neglected all the possibility of seeing something non-classical because the expectation value of the dipole moment operator is just a classical charge current and coupling a classical charge current to the field operator simply gives you coherent states and in our case also coherent states for all the harmonic modes and they are even furthermore in product states so there's not even any entanglement involved between the field modes um yeah this is what you can see here so to to comment on this is this quantum just because you, we have used Hilbert space to describe our observations does not mean at all we have anything quantum because we need to define our observer perspective. And here it's the spectra of harmonic generation, the spectra we can perfectly recover with classical methods. So just because I use Hilbert space does not mean at all it's quantum for me. But now uh, let's go somewhere to some very nice work. As I've mentioned before in the previous slide, if you neglect the correlations and the dipole moment, which is in the same uh, direction what Marcek pointed out in this morning, when you assume that the ground state depletion is negligible, so you mainly have contribution, uh, you mainly uh, remain in your, your ground state in the process of harmonic generation, it's uh, similar to neglecting dipole moment correlations. And as mentioned before, without the correlations, we are just classical. But however, in this uh, nice work, um, also Oren uh, is uh, in there, uh, they have actually uh, considered these correlations. So if you take those correlations into account, you will get some very nice uh, features and observations. So what they uh, then calculated here, they have uh, the harmonic spectra and they computed an additional observer perspective. On the left side, you see the, the Q function. The Q function is basically a way to, uh, yeah, to give a ratio between the variance and the mean of your photon number probability distribution. And as they've uh, shown here, it's um, positive. And what does it mean if the, the Q function uh, is positive? Uh, it's classical. So we can, with classical uh, statistical or probability theory, we can recover uh, described fields with a positive Q function. So this for me is still classical on this observer perspective. However, they have also computed a squeezing for the different harmonic modes, which you can see here with these colors. And we know squeezing is a quantum phenomena. So there we could finally see in the properties of the high harmonic generation, some nice non-classical signatures. So now, um, also, let's talk about entanglement. 
So, so far we have talked about entanglement between electron and the ion or different ele electrons in double ionization processes. So now uh, let's look about entanglement between the optical field modes. So uh, with the simplest approximation mentioned on the, the first slide on harmonic generation, if we neglect the correlations of the dipole moment, we have this uh, yeah, linear term in our field operators. So we end up in a product state, which is not entangled, obviously. But if you uh, phenomenologically introduce some wave packet mode, you can actually uh, derive this entangled state between all the field modes. It's a state Marchik mentioned. We have the shifted coherent state with this quantity delta alpha due to the interaction with the high harmonic generation medium. And these chi q are the, uh, the coherent state of the harmonic modes. And we, we are entangled with this initial state where the alpha is the, the initial state of our driving laser field and the harmonic modes are still in the vacuum. But um, even though we can quantify the entanglement, uh, for me, it's like there's still no observation. We uh, have shown there is entanglement between the field modes. But uh, as an, uh, yeah, as Magic would say, radical empirist, where is my, from my point of view, where's the data? Where are the non-classical correlations in my data I observe empirically? So um, we still have not yet uh, defined our uh, observables here, how to recover non-classical correlations. So the question is still what needs to be measured and can those correlations, if they are measured, be described classically? So is it quantum due to entanglement in the field modes? I would say presumably yes, but there's no non-classical evidence yet in our data. So now going to another very beautiful work, about uh, yeah, inducing non-classical signatures in high harmonic generation. Um, the group from the Technion has uh, driven high harmonic generation in correlated systems. Now the, the question is, um, yeah, when there are correlations present in our, in our system, uh, what signatures do we observe in our high harmonic generation uh, observables, like the field observables? And they have beautifully uh, shown uh, also the Wigner function, as Marcek has explained in the morning, and they have shown photo number distributions for different harmonics for the case of having an uncorrelated and correlated uh, material system. On the left-hand side, you see if we have an uncorrelated uh, state where we drive high harmonic generation, the Wigner function for all the harmonics is in this Gaussian coherent state, which uh, we have also uh, heard before and from Marcek and uh, in the beginning of this presentation. This is just uh, classical and there's nothing uh, quantum in there. But then if you turn on uh, correlations in your system where you drive high harmonic generation, you observe some very nice features. First of all, the Wigner function is not this uh, Gaussian anymore. So it has different kinds of shapes depending which harmonic you pick in the different uh, columns here. So they either have a ring shape, they have this uh, stripe shape uh, or whatever you want to call this. And further, they have computed the photon number uh, probability distribution. For the case of an uncorrelated system where we drive harmonics, it's the same Poissonian distribution you observe for coherent state. The G2 function is one, and this is all classical. But now it's interesting. If we drive high harmonic generation in a correlated system and look in the photon number probability distribution of the harmonic field modes, you observe that it's not a Poissonian anymore. The red function is a Poissonian fit, and it obviously deviates. And further, they have computed the G2 function at vanishing time delay. So the observables here for this case is the Wigner function, but to me it looks the Wigner function is still positive everywhere. The G2 function of vanishing time delay is greater or equal than one for all cases, and the Q function they have computed is also greater than zero. So from my point of view, these features on the observer perspective can be reproduced with classical statistical models. So here the signatures are still classical in the field modes. Furthermore, they have also uh, computed um, photo number distribution correlations between different fields, between different harmonic modes. In here, they have all kinds of different um, um, distributions. And they have further uh, calculated the mutual information between two different harmonic modes and the Pearson correlation coefficient. They are both unequal from zero, which is beautiful because it shows we have correlations between our harmonic field modes. But still, for me, the question is, does this imply that those correlations are quantum? This I don't know yet, because uh, non-vanishing mutual information, for instance, does not imply that the correlations uh, come from quantum. And for the Pearson correlation coefficient, I try to find something in the literature, but um, beyond two qubits, there's not much in the literature really quantifying if the correlations are from classical or quantum origin. 
So still we see beautiful correlations, but the question, are they quantum or not, is still open for me. And I think with this, the last slide. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Philip. Uh, um, yeah, it was very interesting. I mean, I don't think I've ever met a radical empirist before. So, <laughs> yeah. Okay, we still have uh, just a few minutes left for discussion. So I would first like to see in the, yes, if there's somebody from the floor who would like to. Yeah. Thanks for this last part. It was really interesting. Um, so I have a question. I'm, I'm interested in your opinion. Okay. Okay. So I'm, I'm interested in your opinion. So I'm wondering like, is there any reason or like intuition that you can tell why you even think there would be something quantum there, you know, because typically when you kind of study, I don't know, undergraduate like uh, QED or something, you would say, okay, there's many, many photons going on in this thing. If there's many photons. That means it's, you know, going to be classical, right? So is there like some intuition to why at all we would want to, you know, we, we would think that that would happen? Yeah. For uh, high harmonic generation, uh, yes, we have these uh, high photon numbers. So that's why semi classical approaches work beautifully because it essentially captures most of the phenomena. But once we start quantizing uh, our field and have Hilbert space for the field available, we can start to ask many different questions we were not able to ask before in the pure semi classical perspective. So, first of all, there might be some hidden questions we could not even envision before. And second, if you look at the also very um, standard quantum optical uh, models, like resonance fluorescence, for instance, there these interesting uh, non-classical phenomena come from the dipole moment correlations. And the dipole moment correlations, they are also present in an electron bound to a Coulomb potential and undergo some dynamics. So even though we have these presumably totally classical field which drives the process still we have an electron which undergoes some nice dynamics and there can be intrinsic uh, features uh, which give rise to then properties in our field which is not classical and also to the first thing i pointed out there's this very beautiful work by uh, oren and co-workers about driving high harmonic generation with non-classical states of light which was also not possible to describe in the semi-classical perspective because, like I said, there is no way to describe those uh, from the uh, classical way. So and that's why we can we can now start to ask different questions and they might lead to answers we didn't expect before. Anybody else? OK, if not, then maybe I will use the opportunity to ask one question that is burning on my mind. Um, no, in a sense that you said, right, uh, uh, interference, uh, I don't need quantum mechanics for interference. I can understand uh, interference in a, in, a, in a classical way. And that, uh, yeah, certainly we see enough interference in classical systems all, all around us. But I suppose that I go to the laboratory and I do um, uh, an interference experiment with electrons or with photons, right, uh, with, with, with small particles, then basically on my detection system, I will see these arrive as little ping, ping pong balls one at a time. That's once I, you know, accumulate millions or millions of them, uh, will begin to look like this really classical interference result. Um, so in your view, how do you combine, on the one hand saying it's classical because uh, interference is classical with it's classical because it's little ping pong balls arriving at a screen. That's two different, very, two very different classical observations. But they're, like you said, they are both classical. But incompatible with each because other. Because of right? the way part of the duality. Yes. So, uh, yeah, th I mean, that's a very um, interesting thing with this wave particle duality. Um, because, first of all, they are two different experiments. If you observe an interference pattern, then you have a wave description to describe your interference pattern. 
if you don't observe your interference pattern, because for instance, you close your slit or you uh, put an observer at one of the slits, you don't have the interference pattern. So that was, yeah, so uh, this is, so you have two distinct experiments and the whole thing about this wave particle duality uh, just starts to become, let's say, mysterious is when you want to explain two distinct experiments with the same model. But if you keep for this one uh, wave uh, description, for the other one, a particle description, you're totally fine. It only gets confusing if you want to describe two different experiments with the same explanation and model. But then the question, why do we see individual spots on my detector screen? And if you shoot with a low enough density of particles or light, uh, that after a long enough acquisition time, you still get your interference pattern. This is from my point of view, all uh, break down to how we build our experiments. First of all, uh, detector screen has a finite resolution. So you will always at some point see just some dots. And furthermore, the way uh, interference work, interference only happens at the detector. So in order to have interference, so it would be purely in this wave uh, picture, interference only happens at the detector. And if you compute probabilities at which place at the detector, your interference is, for instance, uh, constructive that you have a click, um, you are just still in the wave picture. And if you have a low enough density, the probability is so small that only with a certain, with a high enough probability, one pixel will click. So you have your particle perspective because probabilities in your wave picture are quite low because you only interfere with the detector. Okay, that is food for thought. <laughs> Hi, Jiptesh, I would like to ask you something because you showed a picture of non sequential urbanization and you said that that could be described and that is an example of classical correlation. But how come that nowadays people have looked at quantum interference and they show that it survives, uh, for instance, for co-averaging, or even recently uh, entanglement uh, in laser-induced non-sequential demonization? Can you comment on the assertion that you've made that this would be a classical uh, example of correlation? So, yeah, I think, uh, so what I tried to point out was, was that in that paper, they said like it's classical correlation, but what I wanted to say is that I don't know how come they made this statement. So it's, it's probably not classical, but, uh, so, so what do you say probably? Yeah. So quantum, quantum picture will give the idea. So my point was like from, from classical, like models, we can get some, like some, some interpretations, but regarding the title of the paper, I don't want to comment because I don't know. So classical correlation, what, what it is. So. I have a, um, a question for Livich. So the, your, you make your calculations uh, with trajectories or, or you calculate the wave function and then you plot the trajectory. So yeah. But I, it's okay, it's working. Yeah. I want to clarify, these are not my calculations, but what they do is they get the wave function and once they have the wave function, then they get the trajectories. In, in NATO science, I haven't found a uh, work, but they do it directly with the trajectories. Actually, since we are running out of time, I would suggest that we uh, continue the discussion uh, over coffee. Um, I do want to give Lidice maybe 30 seconds to answer the question that I asked along the way. Would not be fair otherwise. <laughs> Save me, but no. <laughs> Riz, a question. I am not... Uh an expert on this part, but I know there is some work with Bohmian mechanics where they study the coherence. So I will say it might be done, but I cannot say how. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Well, I think that was a very interesting discussion. Uh, my feeling is that we would really, what we would really need right now is a discussion over beer for a couple of hours <laughs> to, to all express our individual opinions. That's unfortunately not in the cards. Uh, but let's thank our panel for really stimulating our thoughts.